So welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, final interview uh, uh, for SETICON 2. Um, we are very lucky to be joined by Dale Anderson, who's come across to us uh, from the East Coast uh, for SETICON 2, which we're very, as SETI Institute scientists, we're very interested to see his face over this side of the country. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> Dale, uh, I'm, my name's Adrian Brown, by the way. I'll, I'm your uh, happy interviewer today. And Dale uh, is, as I mentioned, a senior research scientist whose research takes him to uh, such diverse environments as Chile's Atacama Desert, permafrost in Siberia, and the world's most northernmost lakes and springs in the Canadian High Arctic, and the depths of the polar oceans uh, down in Antarctica as well. And um, so, uh, Dale, I, I wanted to just kick things off with, uh, when did you first get interested in, in space research and linking that uh, to diving and all that sort of thing. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how that formed the scientists today? Well, I was lucky when I was an undergraduate at Virginia Tech uh, back in the 70s. Um, I met George Simmons, uh, uh, an aquatic ecologist there. And I had uh, always been involved with diving throughout my life. My dad was a Navy diver. And I became certified while I was at Virginia Tech. And I was also taking some of his aquatic ecology classes. So he actually invited me into his lab to help him work, because he had seen me do some of the underwater work elsewhere. Um, and that took me to Antarctica. And so flash forward a few years, um, almost 10 years later, uh, Chris McKay joined our group uh, one year, and Steve Squires. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had them down there with us at Lake Hoare. And of course, my first encounter with Mars in a really good way was listening to Steve and Chris argue. <laughs> about various fine points of searching for life, and you can't do this, and you can't say that. And you know, new information was coming in from uh, Viking just a few years before, so it was a pretty exciting time. Uh, so I, I, after I left that, that trip, I came back thinking, yes, I want to get involved with this. Um, and I managed to get a job with uh, John Rummel at NASA headquarters. Uh, and I worked there at headquarters for the next uh, five years, uh, helping to manage the exobiology program, which was a great education. Right. And so at, at headquarters, you were uh, a program scientist looking after the exobiology proposals that were coming in from other scientists. Right. So it was, it was, it was you know, the day-to-day the -day management of proposals and peer review, and then also um, trying to understand how the program should be managed from a, a, a broader viewpoint. You know, what direction should it take? Uh, do we need to refocus things here, move things there? What kind of new researchers need to come in? Um, and what kind of new ideas can we, we bring forward? And, uh, and always the case, you know, how can we make uh, funding a possibility to keep these people working? Right. And were you able to keep uh, diving uh, at, that, at the no, same time? No, I was locked to my desk. Right. Um, so it was hard. It was a hard five years. Right. Um, so the, the good news was I was really in a, a, a steep learning curve, learning about um, the programmatics of NASA and, and how the exobiology program operated. Um, but it also gave me the opportunity to uh, plot and scheme my escape. <laughs> and uh, that took me to the Bunger Hills with a joint expedition with the Russians. And, and tell us a little bit about that. Was, uh, where was that, um, where is that Bungalow Hills? Uh, right, so at NASA headquarters um, at that time, we were trying to get the, the Russians space program uh, together with the US space program to do something more creative and, and uh, jointly, because we hadn't really done anything since Apollo Soyuz at that time. So various groups within uh, NASA were charged with, okay, come up with ideas and let's see what we can implement to, to make interesting, fun things, collaborative things occur and maybe more better things will happen in the future. So a couple of us came up with the idea, yeah, let's have a joint expedition to uh, an area of the Antarctic that we don't have access to because the US Antarctic program doesn't go there and we can have our Soviet exobiology counterparts come with us and we'll do an exobiology related project and by the way, um, it'll be very similar to what we would want to do on an expedition, a manned expedition to the planet Mars, where we'd have a joint um, international expedition, and it'd be a long duration, and we'd have to learn how to deal with those cultural language barriers and other things. Um, so we pulled that off. So we met the Russians in Montevideo in 1991, mm -hmm. in October, and we jumped on the icebreaker, the academic Fedorov, and we circumnavigated about half the continent. It took us two months uh, to get to the Bunger Hills. We had to stop off at a few other stations along the way. Uh, so eight Russians and three Americans, actually two Americans and one Canadian, uh, 
Um, we got dropped off in the Bunger Hills, which is a, an ice-free area of the Antarctic continent. Oddly enough, it was discovered, um, well, the Australians uh, saw it very early on in about 1917 or so, uh, but it was off in the distance, so nobody ever visited it. In 1947, uh, the U.S. Navy actually had uh, a pretty big mapping operation, and they flew over it, and they called it Bunger's Oasis because it was this Shangri-La-like place with lots of, um, lots of lakes, and it seemed to be warmer, and there was no snow, and everybody was very impressed with it. Uh, but not, not very much work was done there until the, the Soviets came back and overwintered there in the early 60s. So they had had some operational experience in this area, but uh, there's like three or 400 lakes there. And several of these lakes have very thick ice covers that remain all year round, and those are the ones that we wanted to go look at. Uh, so this was an extremely remote operation. Uh, the Fedorov came in to the, ice, the Shackleton Ice Shelf, uh, which is about 300 kilometers away. Uh, we flew by helicopter to get to the camp. They dropped us off, gave us all of our supplies, and basically said we'll be back in four and a half or five months. If you forgot it, too bad. If you want it, you're not going to get it. Yeah. Um, and if you get hurt or if anything else happens, uh, you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, so we spent the next four and a half months there together working in this environment. Um, was and, there a doctor on stuff? We did have a doctor. I don't know if I'd let Tolly do anything with me at the time, <laughs> but uh, uh, we did keep some. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we first arrived, uh, just to give you an example, first time I met Tolly, my helicopter came in and I looked down. And I noticed that the Russians' the previous little station there is just some small, s small shelters. Uh, three of the buildings had rolled over um, and were well off their foundations by meters and tens of meters. One was just an exploded mess of debris off in the distance. And I saw Tolly digging around in the dirt. And later on, I came to ask him what he was doing. He says, oh, that was the medical building. And we don't, <laughs> we don't have anything left. Um, so it was uh, a bit sparse. And, and of course, the other thing that was happening was Russia was um, uh, undergoing great turmoil. The Soviet Union was falling apart. Um, and it, we went down with the Soviets and we came back with Russia. Mm. Um, so it was a pretty exciting time. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you tell us how your diving operations worked on a day-to-day -day basis there and, 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 and how, how you'd normally carry out, get ready for a dive and then uh, Right, so it, it really hasn't changed. I've been doing this now off and on for 34 years. And my, my most recent expeditions to uh, Queen Maud Land, and as a matter of fact, it, it has some of the same Russians that uh, I worked with in the Bunger Hills involved in this trip. Uh, but we really haven't changed our operations too much. We, we started off in wetsuits um, a long time ago just because we didn't have the money um, to buy dry suits, and they were sort of novel at the time. But we now wear dry suits. Um, underneath the garments, uh, the dry suits garments, we have uh, a thicker layer of insulating garments that we wear. Um, so they're pretty snug and they're pretty warm. Uh, so we typically set up the camp. Um, we're sitting in the camp for about two months. Uh, we have to have a warm place to keep the dive gear so that it dries out. And uh, regulators are a, a typically a problem in cold water. Uh, they have a bad habit of freezing up and blowing all the air out. Uh, mm. But if you handle that correctly, um, it can be minimized. And that just takes experience in the selection of the right, right regulators. Uh, so we typically will uh, start a dive by uh, getting up, you know, planning the dive out, deciding what we're going to do, or else we've done that the night before. Um, we dress out, we get into the dive suits. Uh, usually two of us will get ready to go in case somebody needs to get back into the water to help the second person. We dive by ourselves underneath the ice. Uh, we get out to the dive site, we take everything out there, all our science equipment, uh, um, imaging equipment if we're going to do photography or videography. Uh, and as soon as we get to the dive hole, we sit next to the hole and start getting our our uh, weight belts on and uh, the dive tanks and put the regulators on everything just hop in and go and we've got a communication system that comes down through the tether um, we are on a tether that's usually between 150 and 300 feet long um, and then we make the dives and what's the depth usually of the ice that you're yeah the thickness on? of the ice varies from lake to lake but it's somewhere between three and six meters uh, so um, you know 10 to 20 feet thick okay and and so when you're in the the bunga hills what what sort of scientific questions were you trying to address there in that area? Yeah, so all of these lakes, including Lake Untersee, where I'm working now, um, we're looking at the microbial ecosystems in the lakes. And these lakes are, uh, are very different from a temperate lake because they've got these thick ice covers on top of them, and they're physically driven systems uh, dominated by this huge ice cover that prevents wind mixing, for example, and it limits the amount of light that, com that comes through the surface. And, of course, if you're a photosynthetic organism, uh, that's a big deal because now you've got 
um, ninety percent of the light that you had on the surface is gone. So usually somewhere between um, one and ten percent is all that you get from underneath the ice. And then of course as you go down the at depth through the water column, that light level goes lower and lower and lower. Um, so that's what we're do looking at. We're looking at the microbial mats, and these are are uh, like windows back in time, and they help us uh, decipher that early rock record. Uh, for example, in Lake Untersee in 2008, um, when I made the first dive in there, we discovered that there were the large conicals from Adelites, which we've never seen before anywhere else. So I've been in probably more Antarctic lakes than anybody right now, and the one dominating feature of Lake Untersee are the large conicals from Adelites that can be up to this high, mm -hmm. about this big around. And of course, we see those exact formations as you well know, yes. in the Pilbara region, at uh, uh, the Strelly Pool Formation and other places. Um, and the when three I was three and a half billion year old right, rocks. and I was there last summer, and I have to admit, I I was really excited when I saw Conicals. saw that live and in person. You know, I've seen the photographs for quite some time, but it was really nice seeing the actual rock record and matching it almost directly uh, to what we've got in the lake. Right. So what we're hoping is that we can start understanding the. Uh, the environmental conditions that drive the microorganisms to form these kind of structures, because we still don't understand, you know, why does, some, why does a, a, a group of single-celled organisms, what drives them to, for, to make any of the morphological features that we see? Why do they want to become a cone? Or why do they want to become a little tiny pinnacle? Or a webbed pinnacle? Or a tent? Um, or why do they want to just stay a flat mat? Mm -hmm. And we see all of these, mm -hmm. and we don't know exactly what's driving um, uh, the organisms to do that, and then we don't know exactly how they're pulling it off. You know, mm -hmm. How do they actually go about organizing themselves and communicating and, and saying, well, you got to get up a little higher and stack this one up and mm -hmm. trap a little sediment and get up here and, and then cookie cutter this everywhere. You know, it's not just once or twice. It's uh, the whole lake is populated by these things. Right. So in your, uh, in your time, as you mentioned, you've probably dived in more Antarctic lakes. How, over time, how have the lakes developed in your experience when you've gone back to revisit them? Do you see developments in your own? Yeah, the biggest, the, the biggest single thing that's changed, of course, is the lake levels change. The lake levels uh, tend to go up and down, and that's driven by local climate. So if you get more melt uh, during the summer, um, uh, these lakes are typically in valleys and, and ice-free areas, and they're surrounded by large alpine glaciers. And at the height of the season, when the temperatures are just above freezing for a few months or a few weeks, um, those glaciers melt, the water runs off to the bottoms of the valleys. And depending on what the evaporation rates are, they either, um, or, and the ablation rates are, they either go up or down in level. And in recent years, uh, most of the lakes in the dry valleys, for example, have risen pretty substantially over time. Um, as the increased melt uh, comes along. Mm -hmm. Is there anything comparable to the Antarctic lakes elsewhere on the planet? What, what's it's, they're hard to find. It's, uh, we, we try, that's actually what took us to the Arctic originally. We were looking for other analogs of the lakes or, or similar ecosystems like the ones that we had found in the dry valleys. Um, but so far we haven't seen those. Uh, it, the, the Antarctic lake ecos ecosystems are probably much older. Um, and of course, you know, that's a continent that's, that's got ice on top of it, whereas the Arctic and the archipelago around it is typically an ocean with small islands and things. So it doesn't develop quite the same geomorphology and, and the geology is a little different. Um, and the Arctic summers are much warmer, you know, so the, the lakes up there typically lose their ice covers uh, year to year. Some of them may maintain their ice covers for a few years, but eventually they usually lose it. And that has a big effect on the lake ecosystem as it turns the water over and uh, you know, sunlight's available to come into the water column and things like that. And they're usually dirtier lakes because the sediment runoffs get, get higher. And, um, what about um, uh, how, uh, I, I under, as I understand it, in some of your more recent dives in the Antarctic, you've seen some sediment uh, fall out uh, from uh, the sides of the lakes and on top of stromatolites and stuff like that. Uh, and and perhaps destroy them. I'm, I'm, is that is that sort of uh, physical action happening from year to year? Um, <clears throat> okay, so it, I guess what you're referring to is at Lake Joyce um, in the Antarctic Dry Valley. It's about 1986. Um, actually, it was just after Steve left our, our group. I went up to Lake Joyce to uh, uh, open that lake up. I hadn't been in that lake before, so I want to make a dive there. I got down to about 20 meters, 
and there was these carbonate structures um, at that depth, and they were all over the place. And that was pretty unusual. We hadn't seen these structures anywhere like that, except for a, some small ones over in Lake Prixel, right in the periphery of the shallow edges. But these were at 20 meters, and they were very robust, and it was a really nice looking uh, microbial community. So flash forward to about 10 years later, I was able to get back to that lake again. I made one quick dive, and, and uh, yep, they were still there, and they still look good. And flash forward another 10 years, and uh, Don Sumner and I uh, put in a proposal to go back down there and actually look at these and study these particular stromatolites. And we got down there, and I made that first dive, and got down to the depths, and uh, the lake level had risen. And what, what happened then was the, uh, these communities that used to be in the photic zone uh, were no longer in that that shallower water, they were in a little deeper water, and it dropped them just a few percentage points below uh, where they could accomplish photosynthesis, so they were toast. Um, so now all we had were these dead structures. So it was a real, it was, uh, was kind of aggravating in the sense that, uh, you know, we didn't get to study the things that I'd originally hoped, but now we got to sort of study the, the effects of what would happen if the climate changed, the, the physical situation changed for these guys, and uh, now we're in a moribund state and now they're getting preserved in the sediment record. Mm. Uh, so now the sediments are building up around these things, and pretty soon, uh, because they're not actively growing above it, you know, now they can't stay above the sediment as the sediment rains out from the, above. So the, eventually they'll get buried, and uh, the communities up north will progress and progressively move to shallower zones, and presumably some of these will take care of the, or start forming these same carbonate structures elsewhere, but it's gonna take a long time, and I don't think we'll be able to see that. Mm. Do we have any idea how old the lakes are in their current form? Yeah, these are these particular lakes are on the orders of thousands of years at the most. I mean, they're they're basically not too old, and and their histories have come and gone. Some of the ones in the dry valleys have actually evaporated down to nothing at times, and then the basins have refilled back up. Um, and that's as a matter of fact, a couple of the lakes. The result of that is they've got uh, salt pans in the bottom of them. So like Lake Bonnie is about. I don't know, seven to ten times seawater at the bottom. It's just a very, very dense saline layer. Mm -hmm. um, same in Lake Vanda. Vanda's got very high calcium chloride levels in it. Um, so they're very, very different lakes than, than what we normally would see. Right. I want to make sure that we uh, go to the audience and have uh, any questions that, uh, yeah, be. Uh, is there a way to bring those back and study them in the laboratory and get enough pressure and yeah, so these, so these things aren't under pressure too much for us to sample them. So that's actually what we do as divers. Uh, we go down and do uh, two or three things. We'll go down and with instrumentation, we'll try to measure the environment a little bit better, like get actually very good, good measurements of light levels um, around where they're growing. Um, we'll also uh, take uh, samplers down with us, so that, like cores, and we can just come down and, and take so, uh, um, cores of very specific microbial communities that we want to look at. And we can do that down a slope, and that might help us estimate the biomass change as you're going deeper or into a different type of community. So eventually, if you're in the shallow regions, uh, you may have um, organisms that are growing really, really well. And as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, they become less and less and less. And then finally, you might get past that photosynthetic boundary, and you go into an anaerobic layer um, where it's just a, a completely different place, and the sediments are black, and it's it's a, a, a different ecosystem. Uh, so we try to collect all of that, and we do bring it back. And depending on what you're going to do with the actual samples, you know, that will guide the kind of analysis that you do. Uh, typical things will be to look at uh, um, the types of pigments that these organisms have in them. You know, the cyanobacteria will have a mix of, of pigments, so we want to understand exactly what those pigments are. Um, sometimes diatoms are present. Oddly enough, in the lake that we're studying in Lake Untersee, the diatoms are absent. Uh, and that's a really key find because we don't know of any other lake that's like that uh, where they're, they're just gone. Um, this is the conical stromatolite uh, lake as well, right? Yeah, or, yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of one of those heads up that there's mm -hmm. something different going on there. And mm -hmm. we don't know what, what, it may not have anything to do with the, the microorganisms forming these cones, but it's conspicuous that these guys are absent and there's cones there. Mm -hmm. And all the other lakes that we've looked at, it's a mix of cyanobacterial mats and and diatoms, and there's no cones in any of those. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It may not have anything to do with it, but it's, uh, it's an interesting aspect. But we also do the metagenomics and genomics and you know, microscopic studies and, and a whole host of other things. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, yeah, you can culture them. You can bring them back and culture them. They're not really any different than a lot of the stuff that you would find in a temperate lake as far as that goes. The, the really, the big thing that is different about these lakes is that they're so far away from everything else and they're so far south um, and they're so um, isolated by this ice cover that other things can't get in there. So there's no fish, there's no birds, there's no insects, no crustaceans. Uh, the biggest organisms that are associated with them are all microbial. Uh, you might get tardigrades and nematodes uh, and a few protozoan, um, but mo for the most part, unless you're in some of the further north lakes around the Antarctic margins, where you do get some copepods um, in the lakes, uh, it's strictly a microbial ecosystem. So the trophic levels are very, very low. And that's exciting because that mimics an environment that occurred prior to 600 million years ago, you know, when Metazoa um, originated. So for the first three billion or two and a half billion years or so of the history of life, um, it was just single-celled stuff doing their thing. And this is a great place to go see them dancing to their own tune and not having to worry about being eaten or burrowed through um, or disturbed. Um, I have a couple questions actually. So the first one is, what kind of precautions do you take to kind of prevent forward contamination of outside pathogens that you're bringing into the ecosystem? You said that you're drilling you know, three to six meters through ice just to get through these places. And I feel like something like a conical stromatolite um, that you just don't really see anymore around the world, I feel like that's something that's really special and aren't you afraid that you're going to Not affect the habitat at all? <clears throat> yeah, good question. So we do think about that, but, but keep in mind, as isolated as these systems are, they're not completely isolated either. So they do have, um, and a good, a good way to show that is um, the only way these lakes would exist if, if, is that you have to have other liquid water coming in to replace them all the time. So if you think about it, um, the ice is always evaporating from the surface and it's always freezing underneath. Um, so if you didn't have and we lose about, at Lake Huntersea, we lose between 35 and 70 centimeters of ice on the surface um, over the course of a year. Uh, so if that just kept going away, you know, if you just evaporated the surface off, eventually it would evaporate down and you wouldn't have any lake left. So you have to keep the water coming back in. It has to balance that amount that you're taking off by evaporation. So these lakes aren't completely isolated. They've got material coming into them all the time. You know, it's typically not us, um, but... Um, They've got airborne microbes that are coming in, so airborne mi microbiology is, um, you know, we've got microorganisms that are scattered throughout the Earth's atmosphere, and those land on the snow in Antarctica and the glaciers of Antarctica. And eventually those guys and everything else, the nutrients, it all gets washed into the lake. So they're not completely isolated. That said, um, one of the other interesting aspects about the freezing process is that it affects the dissolved gases in the lake. And when ice forms at the ice water interface, um, the uh, crystal lattice that forms as the ice forms uh, pushes out the molecules of gases because the dissolved gases in the water are too big. They don't fit in that ice lattice. So it, shoves, it just physically forces them back into the water. So it's like a bicycle pump pumping the lake up with dissolved gases. And one of those gases is oxygen. So the dissolved oxygen levels in these uh, lakes are super saturated. Um, so instead of a temperate lake where we'd have, I don't know, 9 or 10 milligrams per liter of oxygen, um, in these lakes, we can get up to 50 milligrams per liter of oxygen. And of course, where do you go to, in a hospital to cure some types of um, infections is a hyperbaric chamber where you increase the oxygen tension, which most microorganisms don't like. So those kinds of environments are very, very difficult for um, an, uh, a gut flora from us or something that's on our skin. If they get into it, they, they definitely don't want to thrive there. You know, they're not going to do much at all. Um, now, saying that, the, the real worry that we have when we're working in multiple lakes, like if we're in the dry valleys um, near McMurdo, where we might have a dozen or half a dozen lakes that we'll travel around and visit, um, we don't want to cross-contaminate those lakes. You know, so we don't, even though they're com in communication with one another through wind, you know, they, they do the same thing. I'll, I'll give you another example. So, and it comes back to the dissolved gases. So when you dissolve these gases into the lake and they supersaturate, you'll actually get spontaneous bubble formation on any surface area that's above about 10 meters in the water column. Uh, so if you're a microbial mat sitting on the bottom, all of a sudden you're getting all these bubbles all over you, and all of a sudden <laughs> you become buoyant. And the next thing you know, you might actually detach, break off, and you'll end up underneath the surface of the ice and you'll, you'll sit there in the ice like that, and then you freeze into it. And as soon as you freeze into it, 
you start that 10 year or 15 year trip up through the ice as it's ablating at the surface and adding at the bottom. So your relative position gets higher and higher and higher. Eventually you hit the surface, you freeze dry because now you're in really cold wind and you dehydrate and you blow away. And it, as it turns out, about 50 or 60 percent of those cells are still viable when they get put into water. So they may blow into another lake or blow up onto the glacier and get into what's called a cryokinite hole, um, just a place where sediment is blown onto the ice or a rock is on the ice and it, because of the albedo shift, you know, the sun heats up that dark rock and stuff and it gets liquid water. They fall in there. Any place they find a little bit of liquid water um, and some nutrients, um, that's where they start to work their deal again. And so this is one of the mechanisms that, that uh, moves material from lake to lake to lake. Uh, so they're not completely isolated again. But that said, we try, to, we try our best by uh, cleaning the dive gear with things like Clorox and um, what have you before we make dives between the lakes. And then we usually dry the gear outside in high UV environments, you know, the sun's blistering it, and then it freeze dries the uh, suits as well. So we're pretty careful about um, trying to minimize any contamination issues that we have. Did you have a second question? Yes, yeah, I do. Um, so between the anoxic and phototrophic zones, have you been able to find a microorganism that is able to photosynthesize uh, anoxically? Is it using another kind of pathway, like creating like... Yeah, so you have an organism like uh, called chloroflexus yeah. uh, is capable of that. In Lake Horror, we find that um, in, in the anaerobic zone down on the bottom of the lake. Um, and uh, that, that's one of the few things that can do that. Good question. Sounds like we have a, uh, somebody to accompany you in the next dive. <laughs> <clears throat> to, um, one thing I wanted to touch on, uh, how long is the longest dive you've ever done? And uh, what sort of, uh, obviously there's a lot of danger involved. And in, in, um, what are some of the uh, uh, chancier <laughs> things that have happened? Right, so the biggest problem that we have, of course, is not, not necessarily the diving um, or some of the work that we do, but it's really the mistakes that we make as individuals, you know, just doing dumb things. Uh, you know, so in, sort of industrial type accidents, like cutting ourselves or falling down, or, you know, dropping boiling water on your hand. Those are the really more the typical things that you would expect um, that we encounter out in the fields. Um, but also, we have to, uh, um, be really careful about our diving because we are in an isolated place. So most of our dives are kept above 40 meters, you know, about 130 feet. Uh, we don't go into decompression schedules. Uh, we try to really stay away from that. And we have to worry, obviously, about embolizing, you know, where you come up too fast. So we're very, very careful about that kind of diving. Um, the longest dive I've made is about two hours um, uh, in shallow, really shallow water, taking a very set of uh, good cores along a grid that we wanted to make. Um, the, the quickest dives are, you know, five or ten minutes when we just got to go down and snatch something and bring it back. So it really depends on what the job is. And uh, in terms of getting cold underwater, uh, it's really a function of the work that you're doing. So if you're swimming, uh, usually you're pretty warm and sometimes you can come out um, even hot. Uh, other times, if you're just laying on the bottom, um, and when we actually we're very very careful it's a microbial ecosystem on the bottom and if you go down and disturb it you can blow it out pretty easily so we have to be very cognizant of our buoyancy and it's a real skill that our group the people that work with us have to master if you, if you can't control your buoyancy you don't get in the water um, so we'll come down very gently and really the only thing that touches is our fins and maybe our hands on an instrumentation or a piece of instrument package and the really cold dives are where we just lay on the bottom and we're using our fingers to move a micrometer, a stage micrometer, um, and it moves a, a microelectrode into the sediment sort of like a half a micron increment. And you just sit there for 45 minutes doing this. And by the time you get out, your hands are pretty trashed. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's usually the coldest thing are your hands. So what, um, moving forward, what, uh, uh, what's your next uh, trip down to Antarctica and what are you, you going to be doing in the lakes next. Right, so I'll be going back to Lake Undersea, assuming the funding all comes back together, which we're hoping. You know, I've, I've got quite a bit of the funding together and we're hoping to get some matching funds. Uh, it will travel to Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I'm embedded in the Russian Antarctic program on this expedition. It's a privately funded expedition. We'll um, take skidoos and trucks the 120 kilometers across the ice into the mountains of uh, Queen Maud Land, uh, travel down the Anushan Glacier, set up the camp uh, for two months. Um, 
It's a windy place. You know, we hit winds of 110 miles an hour last year um, on several occasions. And then we'll, we'll uh, make the holes in the lake and we'll explore different regions from the places that we did last time. And there's actually another lake above Lake Hunter Sea called Lake Oversea. Mm -hmm. uh, over lake and under lake. The Germans are imaginative Yeah, it's people. pretty creative. Yeah. <clears throat> and the question we have up there is the water chemistry is similar, the geological setting is very similar. Um, are there cones in that lake? Mm -hmm. And if there are cones in the lake, that's great. That means we've got two places where we've got large conical stromatolites. If there are no large conical stromatolites in that lake, it's a big clue is that there's something going on that's different that's preventing that from happening, and we want to find that out. Okay. Yeah, question about um, last year when the Russians poked through at Lake Vostok, um, they said that they poked through, but there never were any results um, mentioned. Right. Do you, right. Did they poke through and just leave it, or did they? Uh, no. So the way that worked, yeah. So Margaret, the way that worked was, uh, it, it comes towards to forward contamination issues. Uh, so Lake Vostok is the lake that's underneath the uh, Antarctic um, continental ice. So it's under four kilometers of ice. It's a lake that's about the lake, size of Lake Ontario. It's a huge lake, um, but it has four kilometers of ice on top of it. So they drilled down using more what would look like an oil rig, and this is very common. This is what um, all nations, you know, uh, Australia, the UK, uh, France, Russia, the US, New Zealand, everybody drills um, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic using these same kinds of drill rigs. And they, they uh, typically use freon and kerosene as a mixture inside the borehole, and that keeps the hole from collapsing as they go down that four kilometers. So the question then becomes, how do you get um, a sample out of the lake without injecting a bunch of kerosene that usually has a lot of bacterial contaminants in it and a lot of organics and stuff, and freon, into the lake? And they came up with a really clever way of doing this. Uh, so they, they drilled down to within about five or 10 meters of the um, ice water interface. They pulled out the drill rig. They put down a hole melter. It's a small melting unit, and they let that go, go through the uh, kerosene and freon and everything. But then once it gets into the ice, it starts generating meltwater. And of course, that meltwater is denser than the uh, kerosene and the freon, which all stays on top of it. And then it melted down and just opened up the lake. So as soon as they opened up the lake, the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure in the, in the water in the lake itself shoved all that stuff back up the hole, and um, they let that freeze. So next year, they'll come back in, and they'll re-drill down that same hole, and they've got frozen lake ice that they can drill into, and they'll recover that ice. I think that's actually going to be the more, the more difficult part of the problem is, is sampling that ice uh, pristinely um, without fracturing it. But they'll get, big, you know, they'll get nice cores out of it like that size, and they'll be able to shave off the outsides and probably be able to get a pristine uh, sample of the lake on the inside. Yeah, they've got they've got some yeah they've got some measurements and uh, Lucan released some information on it. And I can't remember. There was a certain volume of water, or a certain volume that came out of the hole on the top. So they know exactly uh, how much of a plug they've got. I just don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. So they actually had they had fluids coming out of the top. You know, they regulated that as it was coming out. Um, I'm not I'm not sure exactly how much or how far up the hole the the column went before they capped it. Um, I just don't remember. But, but Valery Galchenko, who's working with me at Lake Huntersea um, and is the head of the Institute of Microbiology in Moscow, will eventually get some of those samples in, in his lab. Sounds like a very exciting time for Antarctic science, and, yeah. uh, diving in Antarctic lakes. So uh, unfortunately, we've, we've reached the end of SETI Con 2 uh, with this session. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dale Anderson for his uh, for his attendance and his uh, great participation. Thank you. And if you want to ask any more questions to Dale, please feel free. Sure. I, he'll be around for the next five minutes. I think. Oh, I'll be here longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that maybe it is. Yeah, they, I mean, they, were, they actually collected it in drums and stuff. You know, as the freon and kerosene were coming out, they collected all that. And uh, I, I just can't remember where they shut it off, where they cut the. Um, cut the limit. Okay, I was um, wondering, because I was on a stewardship for Antarctic. Uh, right, lake right, lake. right. And that was what they were talking about. Right. And I wondered when. It yeah, Scar. Yeah, Scar jumped on them originally because they weren't going to do that. And yeah. then they came back in with the melting idea and uh, reconfigured it. Um, so it could actually be that the uh, British get into um, Lake Ellsworth and get samples back before the Russians actually get samples back. We'll see. So that's similar.
Yeah, yeah except there, like except that, yeah, except, yeah, there's over, over 100 of these lakes under uh, yeah, the Antarctic continent. Yeah, so it's, when the Russians were first going into it, they were thinking one lake. Yeah. Well, that's a part of it, but the, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, Lake Vostok is an isolated basin. Um, so it's probably one of the very few basins that's completely isolated. The other lakes, they think, is actually part of a plumbing network that's underneath the continent, and they may communicate between each other. So that's, that's a really different situation, whereas Vostok might be a place where um, you've got a huge sediment record. Well, maybe not a huge one, but maybe, I don't know how deep it is, but a great sediment record that really it's going to be one of the most pristine, perfect type of records for the last 35 million years or so. Um, since, since it's been covered by ice anyway. Uh, so it should be fun. Yeah. So connected, connected lakes. That, that sounds like something that, not lakes, but at least it's something that could happen on Mars in the subsurface of some global regions. You find that very few environments have water bodies. Actually, the, so the Mirabel and Cheetah was one of the first people to start making the connections to the place called the Antarctic surface Mars. So a lot of the features, okay, so the a lot of the glacial features, the fossil ones um, are in Australia. There are live growing ones are in Australia. They do have a lot of you can find Great lady. Um, so, um, you can find in New York Central Park. Really, yes. Yeah. Oh, she was right at the forefront of the. Uh, what did, well, I. The yeah, only one that I. She's a big well, she, she was actually one of these um, uh, people of also that was the other ones in an area of research that yeah, was so like like totally yeah, foreign yeah, so yeah, at the time right. so she was doing it. So, she caught a lot of grief, I think, for the Antarctic stuff. And then it's funny because a few years later, it was all exposed and everybody's going to that that's an issue that was really complicated for a number of years. Um, it was sort of but, part of my you know, job description to figure out ways of getting NSF and NASA to stop getting dirty from each other. Yeah, some of the meetings I didn't think so. It's like I had a bunch of kids in a sandbox. And the very first ones were conical though. And I was doing stuff to learn the other ones. But the most common microbes constitute your Oh, Boston, you love?